We're going to start in verse 6, and we'll go through 13. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. You may be seated. So every one of you physically came into being as a child at some point in time, right? Whether it was February 2nd, 1956, or October 12th, 1974, or whenever, that event was a must in order for you to come into this world and physically live, right? And many of you, if not all of you, today would not only claim to be living, I hope, but would claim to be a Christian as well. But when did you come into being, spiritually speaking? Because the same thing has to happen there. At some point, you have to go from darkness to light, from death to life. Now, there's no question that many are confused on this point today. And it's quite understandable, given the climate of American Christianity for many years now. And this is nothing new. This is what the church has wrestled for years, for centuries. But this is something of tremendous importance. Something that we need clarity on today. Big time. So by God's grace, we seek to have clarity today. Many today would say that they've always been a Christian, that there's never been a time when they weren't. Many would say they're a Christian because they grew up in a Christian home. I was guilty of that. Many would say today would point back to a time when they were baptized or when they were confirmed, and that's really their salvation. Many would point back to a decision they made in the past and then naturally go on to thinking that that decision was completely up to them because as the evangelist said to them, whoever it was, God's a gentleman. He's not going to force his way in, so it's up to you to decide. You're the one who has to open that heart of yours. Jesus is knocking it's up, to you to, it's up to you on whether you let them in or not. Or many would describe a time where they felt something during a highly emotional experience, whether tragedy or not, where they may have seemed to feel God's presence, and this they equate to a salvation of sorts, maybe their own salvation itself. Or many would equate to being a Christian as to going to church. Or even in trying to be a good person. As long as they're trying, then they consider themselves a Christian. See, these are all common answers. And so you see the confusion right away on the multiple answers here. But on this Lord's Day, We seek to clarify how someone becomes a Christian. Because this is what John is bringing up. This is why he's laid that foundation of who God is, uh, who Jesus is, that he is God, that he is light, that we need to be given light because we live in darkness. All this is propelling him to talk about what he's talking about today. He brings up the how so that we ourselves ask the question, When? When for me? 
This reminds us of the, uh, of the purpose that John is writing as he writes this book, as he mentions in the back of uh, the book in chapter 20, verse 31. He writes all of these things so that you believe or continue to believe. Persevere in your believing. And you know what this is all about. That's the whole purpose of it. He's declaring the gospel. So today we do this so that you either can see more clearly according to Scripture, and that's very important, according to Scripture, when you became a Christian, and that you now are one, or so that God may empty you of yourself and empty you of you of, of any preconceived notions that you may have held and hold on to in your empty profession of faith. And hopefully by, hopefully, by God's grace alone, finally, you are brought into his family through his truth that deals with the salvation of your soul. See, this is very important. This is at the root of everything. Now, we'll start today by getting something out of the way right away. Look at me. Look, look at verse 12. What does verse 12 say? Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. It's a very dangerous and sad mistake to believe that everyone everywhere is a child of God. That every human being, no matter who they are or what they believe, is a child of God. This is abundantly clear in this text and the rest of Scripture that that is simply not true. Yes, every human being is created by God, but this in no way should mean that everyone, everywhere, is a child of God. Being created by God and being a child of God are two different things. We should not mix them up. You are physically created by God. In your natural birth as a baby. But to be a child of God, you need to be recreated by God in a spiritual rebirth. That's the scriptural definition of being a child of God, a new creation. That's what a child of God is, is a new creation. John uses the same word as he used earlier, to come into being. Earlier, he said Jesus didn't need to come into being. Jesus was God. He already existed. In fact, all things physically came into being through him. Then he said uh, John the Baptist came into being physically because John the Baptist was not God. He was only a human who needed to be created, just like all of us. Now, spiritually speaking, John says that in order to be a child of God, you have to spiritually come into being. So to believe that everyone, everywhere, is a child of God shows how spiritually blind and ignorant we are to God's truth. God's word is very clear on this matter. John 3.18 says, Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Before salvation, before saving faith, we stand in a position of condemnation. That's what John's saying here. How does that describe a child of God? John 3, 36 says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life Because God's wrath remains on them. God's wrath remains on them? So you can be a child of God and have God's righteous burning anger dwell on you? How does that make sense? If supposedly everyone everywhere is a child of God. This is the wrath of God that needs to be taken away in order for us to be in a position of, That's not condemnation anymore, right? To not be guilty. To not be facing eternal punishment anymore. Our our record needs to be wiped clean. Also, we saw the reality a while back in Ephesians 2, 3. 
that every human being in their natural condition are children of wrath, not children of God. You see, it's rather foolish to believe that everyone everywhere is a child of God. Scripture is incredibly clear on the fact that that's not true. So we get that out of the way. So how does someone become a child of God since not everyone is? Well, we need to be given light. As we know from our earlier studies that we live in darkness, in our sinful nature before salvation. That is our world, not only around us, but in us. So we need to be given light so that we are not overcome by that darkness anymore. So how does this happen? Well, first we have to deal with what John says in verse 9. What does he say? The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. What does this mean? Does this mean that everyone, everywhere, every human being is saved or will be saved? Because Jesus gives light to every man? Is this what John is saying here? Is this what he means? We should answer very quickly, no. Scripture, again, is very clear that there will be many people who will spend eternity in hell. That is a sad reality. Hell is a real place. And there will be many that will be there. Scripture, again, is very clear on this. So there's no way that everyone everywhere will be saved in the end. The theological term or the belief for that is universalism. That is not true at all. That's actually a different religion to believe that. So this phrase, gives light to every man, does not mean that Jesus gives life, gives light, gives salvation to every single person who has ever lived so that everyone will be saved in the end. That's not what he's saying. So what does John mean then when he says, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world in verse 9? What does he mean? Well, We know from what we've talked about before and what we will continue to talk about that this light is referring to a spiritual life, a spiritual light. It is referring to that. But here it's referring to salvation in Jesus, but right now John is saying this in a general way, in a new covenant way. So that in the question that comes up in verse 9 then is what does every man mean? What does that mean? mean every man notice first with me in verse 10 this will help it clear to be clear that john says that jesus was in the world the world was made through him but the world did not recognize him the world did not know him this refers to the darkness that sin has brought us into the darkness that's not only around us but is in us We in our natural condition before salvation are dead in sin, blind to our sin, and deaf to the voice of God. That's straight from Scripture. So here John is saying this about the whole world, every human, which refers to two people groups of the world. There's two people groups, Jews and Gentiles. We see this Jew-Gentile new covenant proof. That's what the new covenant is, where the Gentiles have now been brought in. The new covenant proof in verse 11, where he says that Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. Who is this referring to? Jesus was of Jewish descent. He came first to the Jews, his people. But they, by and large, rejected him as the Messiah, didn't they? But verse 12, yet to all who received him. Salvation is not for the Jews only, right? Thankfully, or else all of us would be left to ourselves without hope and without God. The saving work of God expands out to the Gentiles. They are included in the promise of the gospel. This is new covenant language. With the rejection from the Jews came the full inclusion of the Gentiles. This meant that that now every man, every person, the whole world, every people group was now a part of God's plan of redemption as time unfolded. See, John is looking ahead at 
the gospel promise of the Gentiles coming in. Remember, when he wrote this book, it wasn't during the time when Jesus was living. It was years after that. So he's looking back at that. This must be remembered that every man in this, in what John is saying, is referring to Jew and Gentile, not just Jew anymore. So this must be remembered when we come to phrases like this, the phrases like all or all people or every man or the world or others like it. We need to slow down to see what the writer is referring to within the context of his words. Because this is a very common meaning, especially in John's writings. Okay, so how does someone become a child of God then? Verse 12. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. There's two parts to this. The first is external. Something that happens that's outside of us. Remember verse 7. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all men might believe. What happens externally is God brings the gospel to us. His message that he brings through other people, he brings it to us to confront us of our sin and to show us the only way to salvation, Jesus. The gospel is the power of God for salvation. John the Baptist was to preach the gospel about how we can flee from the wrath to come by escaping it in Jesus through his work of rescue. That's what his message was for the people he ministered to. So in every person's experience of salvation, the gospel must be present. This is what God uses Whether it is reading scripture itself, reading a book or a track about the gospel, hearing the preaching of the gospel, and then right then you are saved, or that gospel that you heard just lingers in your mind as you leave that place and it won't leave you alone during the next week or so as it comes back to memory. This hearing can be in a setting like this or one-on-one or in a Bible study. These are all possible situations, but guess what? What stays the same is the gospel must be there. The gospel is the common factor of all of those situations when God saves. The true gospel, which remember is not just moral stories about people in the Bible. Or someone's testimony. Or just facts, historical facts about Jesus and not explaining the purpose for Jesus. Of why he came. And how that benefits the sinner. Or the gospel is not even an emotional experience someone may have in a a Christian environment. Or even not in a Christian environment. That's not the gospel either. The gospel is the message of truth according to what God has said about our sin and our need for salvation in Jesus alone. That's what the gospel is. This is the ordinary tool used by God to save sinners. We see this in this text. And all throughout Scripture, sinners that are saved believe the message they hear, believe it's true, and believe it as it's relating personally to them with their sin, their problem of sin, their guilt before God, and their desperate need for trust in Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And that's what saving faith is. You believe the message that you hear. You understand what, it, what that person's saying about you. It's for you. So you believe that message. You believe it's true. You agree with it as it pertains to you. And then it comes a reality. It comes a personal reality where you put your faith and your trust as you repent of your sin. You put your faith and trust in Christ alone for your way to get into heaven, for your way of salvation, for your way of rescue. So you see, your, see, you see your sin and your need for Christ. The gospel that must be believed is that God is holy and you are unholy. But you have to be holy. Not a little bit holy, but 100% holy in order to be in a right relationship with God. 
100%. How is that possible given your sinful heart? Jesus' person and work alone and his life, death, and resurrection is the only way you can be cleansed and your sin forgiven. So God, through the Spirit, makes you holy and causing you to be born again, to cleansing you, purifying you, which is because of the perfect work of Jesus on the cross as your substitute, as you trust in him alone, saying that you stood in my place. You traded places with me. And that because of your work, I have made, I've been made new. And he keeps you in that position of holiness so that he can present you to himself in the day of judgment. And you will go clear. You will be freed. You will be uh, vindicated because of Christ. And so the command of the gospel then becomes this. Will you forsake yourself and turn to Jesus for the forgiveness of your sin? Will you do that? And this is from somebody talking to some other human. So that's where the command comes in. The gospel that must be believed is this. Wait, didn't you just explain the gospel? Yeah, I'm going to explain it again in a different way. That God is perfectly righteous. And you are completely unrighteous. But you have to be perfectly and completely righteous in order to be innocent before God, the judge. How is that possible, given your sinful heart and the guilt that you have in standing before God, the judge? See, Jesus' righteousness alone is the only way that you can be declared not guilty. He has to take your place. He has to come in and take your place before the judge. So the judge sees him and not you. He has to live for you in perfect obedience because that's what his law demands. That's what he demands to be in right relationship with him. So he comes and lives for you in perfect obedience and dies for you as a perfect sacrifice on your behalf because that's the punishment that you deserve. And finishing that work of your salvation in his resurrection from the dead accomplishing what you need to do. So he has to take your sin upon himself so that he can give you his righteous standing before God. Do you see what the gospel says here? This is the righteousness from God that is revealed in the gospel. And through this gospel, as God works, the Holy Spirit works within you so that you throw off any claim or any goodness you may have toward your salvation. You have nothing to bring to God. No merit worthy of any acceptance. And as this happens, as you see this, and you throw off yourself, you throw yourself on Jesus, on him alone, because he's the only one who could take it for you, who could live for you and die for you. And as the Holy Spirit works within you, you receive him, receiving him and his merits on your behalf. As your very own. And by this faith, faith, as the Holy Spirit works within you, you cling to Christ as your only hope of rescue, redemption, and justification, innocence before God. And this faith continues as God works, continues to work within you by bringing out a living faith as you're kept in God's hands as God's child. So here comes the command again. Will you forsake yourself? Any goodness you may have, any claim to any merits you may have, and anything, no matter what it is, what you call it, will you forsake yourself and turn to Jesus for forgiveness of your sin? That's the only way, only way. As you look to the true Jesus, the true light, who needs to give you light and dispel the darkness, will you do that? This is the gospel that must be there when you're saved. There are many ways to explain the same gospel, but they all must have the same elements. The biblical truth about God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, and who they are, and what they do, and what they've done, and what they will do. And the truth about us humans, and who we are, and what we cannot do because of what we've done. 
You see, these are the basic essential elements of the gospel that can be explained in many different ways, but you hit all of those points in declaring our sin and our need for Christ. This all explains what grace is. Our need for grace, our need for mercy. This answers the question, the age-old question for the every human heart. How a sinful human being can be right with God. The gospel answers that. The second part in how we become children of God is the internal. John answers this in verse 13. How do we become children of God? By being born of God. This is what happens internally. As God brings us the gospel and works through the Holy Spirit, he recreates He makes someone new. This is just a precursor to what John will bring out in chapter 3. But he mentions it here to make it clear that the way we are given this light, the way that we become children of God, is by being born from above, being born of God, by being reborn by the work of God alone. Did you have anything to do with your natural birth? Did you make any decision? To come into this world? Was it up to you in any way? No. So how in the world, why in the world would we think that in our spiritual rebirth? That must take place. So we need to be reborn by God, by the life giver. See, John uses three negative statements to make it clear that becoming a child of God is not by, number one, being born of natural or physical descent. Someone does not become a child of God because of their heritage or their family lineage. The Jews have great importance to this as they claim and call themselves children of Abraham. We see this in John 8. They say, we've never been slaves of anyone. And so this natural descent, this physical descent, we do the same thing today. Whether we grow up in a Christian environment, like I did, I grew up in a quote-unquote Christian home, so hey, I'm good, right? That's a natural kind of default thinking of many people. Or have family history in that area of being Christians. Or we grow up in the church, right? That's another way of looking at this heritage aspect, This is even a default thinking of many kids who go to Christian schools. Because of some tie to natural or physical descent, many think that this makes them a Christian. It's a fatal error to think that just because of these factors, you are then a child of God. Number two, it's not by human decision. It's not as though God leaves it up to you to make a decision one way or the other. Many have put faith or belief as the cause of being born again. This is said to be their action and cooperation that's necessary for their salvation. So God does his work, and then you are to answer, respond, and do your work. You are to cooperate with God. And this is the final piece of the salvation in order for you to be saved. The hinge upon which your salvation turns. It's up to you. That's the ultimate thing. It's up to you ultimately. So once this person so-called acts in faith, then they are born again. So faith comes first, and then they are born again. They are born again because of their faith or belief. But if that's the case, then why do I need a new heart? If my faith comes before I'm born again, why do I need a new heart? The scripture is very clear that says, I have a heart of stone. I need to be given a heart of flesh. I need a new heart. According to this falsehood, my heart is ar- already has the ability to act righteously as faith is a righteous deed according to God. So if faith, any action, anything, is the cause of my rebirth, what does that say about who I was and my condition before that? And we'll get to this next week more, more in depth because this is very important and this is essentially the central aspect of Reformed theology. So we need to know this. But John is very clear 
that becoming a child of God is not by human decision. It's not by the human will. It's not by your choice. It's not by your choice of human nature. As I said, we'll talk about this in great clarity next week. So hopefully you come and listen intently. Uh, thirdly, it's not by a husband's will. Interesting kind of terminology. This is referring to more directly coming from the male passing it on to the child. So being a child of God is not because of your parents with the emphasis of that being passed on from the male. That doesn't happen either. By stating all of these, John is emphasizing that we only become children of God by being born of God. Our being born again, which is the first piece of becoming a child of God, has nothing to do with our action or anyone else's action in any way. It is solely a, God, a, a work of God. God needs to recreate us because of who we are. Sinners. Lifeless. The effect of this is that there is a clear change in me. Once I become new, once I've been made born again, there's a clear change in me and in my life. It's like I'm awake now. It's like I've been blind all these years and now I can see. Now everything just fits together and I understand how this fits together with what God is saying here. Awake to God and his truth and awake to my sin. According to God's truth, the basic level of this. So being born again is is a noticeable thing to ourselves. Something's happened to me. I've been confronted by God himself and he's shown me my emptiness and shown me my only way that I could be filled up. But we can't believe without being born again first. You have to be born again first. Now this is a miraculous work of God where the gospel comes to us and the Holy Spirit works. We're born again and immediately, right away, right, right at that moment, instantaneously, we believe. It's a, it's a whole crazy operation that God does as the great physician on the heart. But being born again has to happen first before we can believe and receive Jesus. See, our belief is the fruit Being born again is the root that causes action, growth, and the fruit to grow. Put another way, belief is the result of my spiritual rebirth, not the cause. It's the result. This is what John is teaching us. We can see this more in the verb tenses that are used. Listen to this. Born of God, or more literally, were born of God, is a past tense. Also, it's a passive, meaning that this is something that God does to us. I'll give you an example. Lazarus was passive in Jesus raising him from the dead. Same thing here. He didn't do anything. He was not active. He did not decide for Jesus to bring him back to life. It was not up to him in any way, shape, or form whatsoever. He was merely passive. Jesus did it. By the power of God, Jesus did it to raise him to life, to show God's glory, God's grace, to give us a picture of this rebirth. So he didn't do anything. He was dead. What can a dead person do? Same with us. If we take what the Bible says clearly, according to what God says, This is the condition of every human being apart from salvation. We are dead. It's a reality we must face. So the phrase, to those who believed, is literally to those believing. It is a present, ongoing action. And notice this with me. So the present, ongoing believing comes from something that has already been done in the past to somebody which is being born again. Being born again comes first. And then the present ongoing action from that cause continues. So the present ongoing believing is the fruit of already being born again. 
This is what John is teaching. This brings us to how we can tell that we actually possess saving faith in Jesus. How can I tell? This believing doesn't go away. It doesn't cease to exist. It continues. It perseveres. Though it may go through trying times, it doesn't quit. This is not talking about just us professing to believe with our mouth. Anyone can physically do that, and many do, without actually possessing it. It is the possessing of belief that shows itself. Our possession shows itself in continuing to believe the truth of the gospel, continually coming back to that truth, standing on that truth, believing it. If we're swayed one way and we're going with the trends of the world, God brings us back to that truth. That's how he grows us, nourishes us through the word, his truth. Growing in our understanding of the gospel and ourselves in our, relation to, in our relation to being saved. It's clear evidence by word and deed that I'm trusting in Jesus alone for my salvation. I'm trusting in him alone. I don't put any of it on me. It's all about Christ and what he's done on my behalf and I'm unworthy, an unworthy recipient of his grace, love, and mercy. So this is shown in my life, in my word and my deed. It's not by anything that I do. I put no confidence in my flesh, in myself. This is a part of true saving faith, that I forsake all that I am and all that I have and cling on to all that Jesus is and all that he has done for me on my behalf. That's the outgrowth of gospel work, saving work of God. Further evidence is living by the Spirit, where I war against myself and against the things that, I, that my flesh wants to do. It's a constant battle against myself. So because the Spirit lives in me, I strive to die to my sinfulness, which shows itself in ongoing repentance and trust and obedience. This is all evidence of salvation. And this is a reality that should be present not only in my visible life, but in my secret life. What's your secret life look like? Behind closed doors. All this shows itself in a hatred towards sin and a love toward Jesus and the truth that is in him. Think about this. If the new creation is a reality that God brings to the sinner who used to be dead, who used to be enslaved to their sin, sin only wanting to sin, everything that is not of faith is sin, so that's our whole life before Christ, if God radically changes somebody, changes somebody, brings them to life, gives them eyes to see, a heart to feel, then what do they think about their sin? Now they hate it. They used to love it, but now they hate it. Now they love Christ. They love God. Is this a reality of your life? Resting in Him as Savior and submitting to Him as Lord. Becoming a child of God is by God's grace alone. And being a child of God, living that life as a child of God is seen by how that grace works in me and through me. There's evidence in my belief and my behavior. It's not perfect. Again, I've reiterated that over and over again. It's not perfect. It's not about perfection. We're never going to reach perfection. But is this a pattern? Is this a, if you could look at your life, is this what somebody would see? Belief and behavior lining up with what God says a child of God looks like. Is this you? Is this you? If it's not, then will you forsake yourself today? 
Will you forsake everything, who you are? Forsake yourself and turn to Jesus and Jesus alone for the forgiveness of your sin. Walk in newness of life. Experience what that truly is. It's glorious. It's amazing. It's the purpose and meaning that you can have in that life. And the great reality is that God never leaves you. God never forsakes you. He's inside of you. He's not going anywhere. And he promises to keep you by his power. And his power is called faith, according to Peter. It's his power that keeps you, keeps you going, causes you to persevere because you put your faith in Christ alone. 